Welcome back to Presenting the Past, a podcast series exploring the digitized collections of public radio and television in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, otherwise known as the AAPB. I'm Christine Becker, Associate Professor in the Department of Film, Television, and Theater at the University of Notre Dame and co-host of the ACA Media podcast from the Society of Cinema and Media Studies. The AAPB website features nearly 60,000 public radio and television items streaming online, and this podcast brings you conversations with the researchers, scholars, educators, and producers who have used that article archival material, and they share their insights about what they have found. So I'm honored to chat with our guest today, Shirley Snavy, who is Vice President of Broadcasting for Indian Country Today, which is a nonprofit multimedia news enterprise that serves indigenous communities with news, entertainment, and opinion. So thanks so much for joining the podcast today, Shirley. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. The AAPB has a special collection of documentaries from Vision Maker Media, and you were instrumental in getting this content digitized and contributed to the AAPB. So can you tell us a little more about Vision Maker Media and your interest in archives? I was executive director of Vision Maker Media for about 16 years, and we are the largest producer of American Indian and Alaska Native documentaries. But I just have to tell you, my whole reason for being involved in the archives is my mother. Um, my mother is an author. Her name is Virginia Driving Hawks Navy. And um, she's written, oh, uh, over 40 books on a broad genre, um, but all, all about American Indians. And so uh, there was a bidding war going on for her archives, which I thought was amazing. Um, so anyway, I, that's how I got involved in archives from the beginning was through my mother to understand the importance of archives. And of course, as a documentary film producer, you know, you're always looking for another shot. You're always looking for more material to illustrate what you're trying to do. And so I'm always looking and especially now uh, in my new position, um, I'm always looking for good film. Well, let's also then talk about your, your current venture. You're uh, Vice President of Broadcasting for Indian Country Today. So can you tell us more about Indian Country Today, the work for you, you do for them as Vice President of Broadcasting? We have a daily newscast that I oversee, and uh, it's taped, <coughs> taped, excuse me, <laughs> recorded in uh, Phoenix, Arizona at uh, the Cronkite Center for Journalism and Mass Communications. Uh, where we have the studio there and a wonderful relationship with Arizona PBS. And uh, we do a half hour daily newscast that we deliver to PBS stations. I am just so honored and grateful to be part of this team of wonderful journalists. Um, there's about 18 of us across the country and uh, I'm just having a great time being back where I started in journalism. <laughs> mm, yeah. What kind of uh, aspects are covered in those news programs? Well, we have a, a five minute block that we share with radio stations and it's the headlines. And then the interviews are with uh, newsmakers from around the country. For example, today we had on uh, John Tasuda, who is a Native American Republican. And we have him on about every other week to give us some uh, commentary from that side of the aisle. And we also had Rick West, who is leaving the Autry Museum of the American West. Um, he was also the founding director of the National Congress of American Indians. Well, I wonder if you could also speak a bit to then the unique perspective that comes from this kind of journalism and particularly perhaps, you know, Native American reporters working on Native American issues and the importance of that perspective coming through that news reporting. All of the reporters that are on staff are a member of a tribe, federally recognized tribe. Uh, we've got uh, Alaska Natives, Ojibwe's, uh, Lakota, we have Pasquayaki, Navajo, Hopi, Pueblo, and they bring to the table their own perspective and history. And even the young ones, uh, and we've got quite a few reporters that are in their 20s, um, some in their 30s, you know, they grew up with this knowledge. Um, you know, when we're talking about boarding schools, for example, you know, we had the tragic news of uh, 215 children's graves found in Canada. Their families lived that experience. Uh, my mother went to boarding school. Her mother went to boarding school. And so, um, you know, we carry those memories with us. And by the way, I just have to say that not all boarding schools were bad. Um, I mean, there are some really remarkable people that came out of that boarding school era, Chuck Trimble being one, who really uh, says that it saved his life. 
in the fact that his family was starving. His father died unexpectedly and very young. And so his mother really had no choice if she was going to keep her children alive and fed to ship them off to boarding school. Um, so we've got that kind of background when we're talking about our issues. Um, and we understand firsthand those wonderful things that go on in Indian country and then our challenges as well. And one factor of news, of course, daily news is it can be ephemeral and time moves on and it sort of then it's yesterday's news. But um, of course, here at, at this podcast with the AAPB, we're especially concerned with the notion of archiving that material. So what plans do you have in place to archive that material? You also brought up, of course, a, a very important factor of money, of finding the money to, to archive that. Um, so what, what do you have in place to archive some of this material? We've got everything saved, you know, in various hard drives and the cloud and, and all sorts of uh, places. And I got the paperwork from AAPB to start, just waiting on a couple of things and I'm hoping to employ some interns to help us transfer the programs onto the hard drives that AAPB will be delivering to us. You know, we, we go back, all of us go back into our archives. And by the way, Indian Country Today's podcast has only been going on since April of 2020. So, you know, it's not going to be that hard to go back to 52, you know, weeks of, <laughs> of content and get that done as opposed to picking up later down the road. But we often return to those interviews. In fact, when we celebrated our first anniversary of the, the podcast, um, we went back to the first interview that we did. And the first interview that we did was with Dean Seneca who is a native epidemiologist. And uh, we wanted to talk to him about uh, the coronavirus in Indian country. And so we had him back on the one year anniversary. And you know, when you think about how this has impacted our lives and all that we've learned and all that we assumed way back when, that right there represents a huge body of information that will influence things in the future. I don't think this is the last pandemic that we're going to see. And the lessons that we can learn now are important. In fact, Mark Trahant, our editor, when the pandemic hit, he went back to the Spanish flu pandemic basically 100 years ago and uh, how that had an impact, uh, even today a lasting impact, and how Native people uh, had to deal with that pandemic back then. When you're noting that much of the new stuff, of course, is already digitized, right? It's already in that digital space, but a lot of the past content and going back decades and, for instance, your earlier work with um, Vision Maker Media is converting that, right? Digitizing all those reels and tapes. So any uh, stories about that, about that process of digitizing the past material and, and especially the importance of digitizing that past material, making it publicly accessible for, for current generations? <laughs> you know... Labeling is so important. Mm. <laughs> you know, we had uh, DAT tapes. Remember DAT tapes? Yeah. We used to do a lot of radio programming as the American Indian Radio on Satellite. Um, and we had a program called Native America Calling. And we acquired a lot of series from across the country. Wisdom of the Elders from out on the no Northwest Coast was one of the series. Um, did a, a series uh, in South Dakota, Dakota Olawan. Um, you know, Dakota music. And uh, all these series were just in boxes and boxes and boxes. Uh, we assigned an intern to, to go through and start doing it. And she just threw up her hands and she says, this is hard, <laughs> you know, because we didn't know what's on the tapes and they're just labeled the date. Mm. <laughs> well, at least they had the date on them. Um, but, you know, keeping good records right off the bat is so important. You know, no matter what your format is, you know, when we had uh, reels and reels and reels of film and uh, audio tape and to go back to those and realizing how sensitive that material is to digitize it. And uh, I am so grateful that I found Alana Stone, who is still working at Vision Maker Media and um, directing the archives project that continues there after all these years of getting that collection done. Yeah, and I know we've got many librarians and archivists listening who, as soon as you said labeling, were like, yo, yeah, I'm sure they, they broke out in big smiles with, with that about that challenge. 
Um, and especially considering just how much content has been produced. And again, that important part of making it accessible to people. And so, you know, you mentioned people kind of growing up with this knowledge, but um, learning about other tribes or other, or other places or non-Indigenous people listening to this and understanding elements of um, Indigenous life. It's just, it seems such like such important projects. That was one of the things that we did on our 40th anniversary. And I actually stole this from uh, Cartemquin Films in Chicago when they celebrated a, an anniversary. I think it was 50. And so they did 50 films in 50 weeks or something like that. And I thought, well, we can do 40 films in 40 weeks to celebrate our 40th anniversary. But getting that collection ready was a little bit daunting. Um, having to clear all the rights and negotiate the rights with these producers, you know, with some of these films that were indeed 40 years old. But what we ended up with was a very wonderful collection that's available to anyone to listen to, watch on the American uh, AAPB website um, through the Library of Congress. So I'm very proud of that collection that, that we put there. And I've even gone back to that as source material for some of the stories that we're doing now at Indian Country Today. We'd love for our listeners to be able to hear some of this material. So are there any segments in particular on the AAPB website you'd like to highlight? Well, I think that uh, viewers might like to listen to some old rock and roll. Oh, yes. Um, we did a, a documentary of one of the hottest bands uh, through SOAR, a film company out of the Southwest called Exit. You know, a lot of those guys that were in that band are still around and doing good things in Indian country and have gone on to serve on tribal councils and uh, run departments and, um, you know, just really impacted where we are in Native music today. That program sounds fascinating, and we'll put a link in our show notes on our website for anyone who wants to follow up and listen to that. We also do have a clip of something we can listen to right now. So what can you tell us about what we've got here, Shirley? Since boarding schools are in the news right now, uh, one of the pieces that we did on boarding schools was called The Thick Dark Fog. And it's a, a journey of Walter Little Moon from the uh, Oglala Lakota tribe in South Dakota. And he talks about his experiences in the boarding schools. Okay, let's listen to an excerpt from Thick Dark Fog. Walter kept talking. His memories would come out in fragments. So I'd write down whatever he said. And as time went by, we started cutting those pieces of paper and putting memories together that belonged together. And then Jane brought in a book, Trauma and Recovery, by uh, the author, I think, was Judith Herman. And this was based on the Holocaust. But uh, when she was reading, I was able to take out a lot of the words and replace them with the Lakota, with Pine Ridge, uh, the environment here. And it be began to make sense. And that's when I realized that my mind uh, lacked focus. It was fragmented. And I would change the subject to stay away from a lot of the pain. And I didn't even know where the pain was coming from. I came to meet Walter, Little Moon, and his wife, Jane, through my work here at the Victims of Violence Program in Cambridge, Somerville, Massachusetts. When Walter and Jane walked into this building, Central Street Health Center, it was very clear that he was uh, in a lot of pain. Walter's experience embodies the context of intergenerational trauma. So you have a culture that survived near genocide on its knees, and then you pluck a child out of this family and everything that's kept them alive. There was no safe context in which to talk about the abuse and things that he suffered. You know, he had to keep it secret, he had to keep it silent, he had to bear it alone. There wasn't a place where these words were welcome. 
and it's really affecting listening there, especially this idea that uh, the description on the website says children were not allowed to speak their language or express their culture or native identity in any way. And I think that really speaks back to your mission and the things that you've been doing in your career about making sure these stories are told, these stories are passed on, these stories are spread um, across the community and beyond that. And so I think it's, it's really powerful work. And I'm glad we've gotten to hear some pieces of the power of that work. And that particular documentary is important in the way that it shows a man that dealt with his youth and the issues that arose from his attending a boarding school, which often, uh, well, well, the whole reason that boarding schools were started in the first place with uh, the Carlisle Indian School is that the director said, kill the Indian and save the man. And it was the government's attempt to assimilate Native Americans so that they would forget their cultures and languages. Well, guess what? They failed. Well, let's go back to the beginning then, the notion of early broadcasting, these initial urges to record, to capture, to disseminate the, the voices and you know, ideas and principles of Native culture. So do you have any thoughts about the beginnings of Native voices on public broadcasting? Well, 45 years ago, there were a number of, well, there weren't a number of, and there were about 12 Native Americans working within the public broadcasting system. And uh, one of them was my mother, as a matter of fact, um, was doing some project work for South Dakota Public Broadcasting at the time. Another one was uh, Frank Blythe, who was working for a station in Arizona. George Bordeaux, who well, I'm not going to remember everybody. Um, but they got a little seed money to uh, come together and meet and hash out how they could influence public broadcasting. And at the time, some of these stations that, well, for South Dakota for one, Arizona for another, Minnesota for another, that had sizable populations of Native Americans were already producing content about tribes uh, in their region. And they started as a library so that they could share all of this programming with each other. And this was before anybody knew what a satellite was. So they would actually box up these tapes and films and uh, send them through the mail or put them on the train or uh, bicycle them around to other stations so that they could broadcast this material. So that's how they started. And uh, we were the first, uh, we were the National Minority Consortium, but they changed the name because minority isn't a popular name anymore. Um, and so they're now the National Multicultural Alliance, which is five uh, different organizations, Pacific Islanders and Communications, Black Public Media, Latinos and Public Broadcasting, and so, and then Vision Maker. And so they feed the public broadcasting system diverse content, along with, you know, some of the other organizations out there like uh, POV, Independent Lens, and uh, some of the programs on the World Channel. So, you know, I mean, if public broadcasting is going to be reflective of our nation, we need to include all voices. There was a notion years ago that, uh, Amer and, the, and I remember hearing this in school and being taught this, that America was a melting pot and that what does it mean to be an American? And I think over the years that that's kind of changed and really enriched our lives to learn more about other cultures and learn tolerance and respect and understand our neighbors. And I think that's one of the things that public broadcasting attempts to do well is to bring diverse voices and peoples to the air. And I just really think that if you know your neighbor, you're going to understand where they're coming from. And uh, I think that understanding different cultures is really the way to, I don't know, take a look at racism and understand why it's important that we all have these diverse voices and uh, ways and customs in the United States of America. One other uh, form of media we should consider here, particularly as we're on a podcast, is the notion of radio. Could you speak to the importance of radio and its role in uh, Native American communities? One of the collections I understand that um, AAPB has is from KWSO in Warm Springs, Oregon. And, you know, that was a, an effort that started back in the 70s was to create public radio stations on the reservations. And I think when uh, I, I was there, there was like 26. And I think that number has more than doubled now. But I remember going to the grand opening of the KILI radio station on the Pine Ridge Reservation when they first started and going on the air. And 
the importance of those radio stations are, number one, health and safety. In some of these remote areas, it's not always easy to get communications. Nobody has phones because nobody invested in wire out there. You know, now people have cell phones, so it's a little bit different. But a storm is coming. Please look out. You know, things like that, that mainstream radio stations weren't doing. Um, and the other thing about public radio, radio stations on reservations is language preservation and revitalization. And uh, I think just about all of them will have partial broadcast in their local languages. Um, the Navajos uh, are particularly good at that and some of the Ojibwe stations and as well as Pine Ridge. Whenever I get out there, my parents live in Rapid City, so I get out there and I love listening to that radio station. You know, you never know what you're going to hear next. But the work that they do in cultural preservation is just awesome. You know, that is important to Americans as well because tribal cultures developed around their geographic location. And so their language is reflective of their environment. You know, everybody says there's a hundred words for snow in, in uh, the Inuit language and, you know, those uh, Alaska tribes because snow and how you deal with snow is very important to them, right? Because they have a lot of it. Tribes in the center of the country uh, have a lot of different words for walking because that's how we got around. You know, I mean, so uh, things like that are just important to understand. And, and I'm really happy to see more Native American chefs that are looking at the food that we can harvest locally. Um, you know, and I think that we saw that in the pandemic that uh, everybody was into gardening and growing their local produce um, because that's the way you could get food. And, you know, becoming more self-reliant. And I think that's one thing that the tribes can teach America is uh, how to live on the land in a better and respectful way. You know, as both a historian and, and teacher myself, it's really so inspiring to hear you talk about the importance of producing this material, sharing this material, and of course, archiving this material. And listeners can check out some of the historic Vision Maker Media programs uh, by visiting the Vision Maker Media Special Collection on the AAPB website. And there's also a soon-to-be-launched exhibit titled Native Narratives, the Representation of Native Americans in Public Broadcasting, featuring many programs submitted for a Peabody Award that were digitized through a grant in collaboration with the University of Georgia's Brown Media Archives and funded by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. So look for that on the AAPB website soon. The URL for that website is AmericanArchive.org and links to additional programs, including ones Shirley has discussed today, can be found in the episode show notes at acmedia.org backslash AAPB and on AmericanArchive.org, where you'll find a link to the podcast page at the bottom of the website. Thanks so much for spending time with us today, Shirley. You're welcome. And thank you to the listeners out there for your attention to this episode of Presenting the Past. I'd also like to thank sound engineer Todd Thompson at the University of Texas at Austin for his post-production work on this podcast and for composing our theme music. Thanks to Bill Kirkpatrick at Denison University for his assistance with distributing the podcast. And thank you to Ren Marchese at the AAPB for her help with planning and organizing these podcasts. Please join us next month for another deep dive into the digital resources of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. GBH.